uh, issues don't. So today we're going to talk about pulmonary complications of COVID-19. Uh, it's this is an important topic because uh, a lot of the times people think about people getting COVID and then are they over it yet? Uh, you know, have they um, gotten better from it? And you know, more and more we're seeing symptoms that can last uh, weeks or months or uh, really, we don't know how long. It's it's really still being kind of studied. And so from our standpoint, you know, we wanted to kind of talk about this subject because th these are questions that are going to continue to come up and uh, not just in the short term, but really in the long term as well. So, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions about this, please type it in the chat box and we'll go ahead and and uh, and start then. So when it comes to pulmonary complications, uh, as far as long COVID goes, you know, we're going to start by talking about symptoms that can be pretty common in, in patients that have had COVID and have seemingly recovered. So the acute symptoms can, can recover and they, they can have some uh, sequelae that, that kind of last a long time. And sometimes it's more obvious than others, but you know, it can have wide ranging impacts. There are, when people discuss long COVID, it's not only pulmonary symptoms, they also have GI symptoms. They can also have multiple different systems uh, associated with it. Today, we're gonna focus on the pulmonary complications. And it's not limited to dyspnea, uh, ventilator dependence, oxygen dependence, fibrotic lung disease. Uh, another one is changes in their PFTs. So it, it can actually kind of change uh, how the lung functions how, and how it, it really works. And some of that, you know, you'd expect it to continue to improve, but sometimes people have lo long lasting issues. You know, some of our pulmonary doctors have said that they're following patients like year, year and a half for lung issues from long COVID and pulmonary complications. So I just don't, really, I just don't think a lot of people realize how long the pulmonary issues are going on for now. Right, and there's kind of, you know, in the public, people think, oh, have you gotten over it? Are you better? And it, it's kind of a longer discussion than just yes or no. It's uh, sometimes people, they get over a little bit, but they can't, they've lost their sense of smell. You know, I, I've heard about cooks and, and chefs that cooking is their whole life and they've, they've lost their sense of smell. And it's, it's really causing depression and, yeah. and some really bad things. You know why? People. Like, it was really interesting losing a sense of smell and taste. I didn't mm -hmm. realize the pathophysiology behind it. But what I'm learning more is that um, I was reading some articles actually affecting the nerve endings that actually help us be able to taste and smell. Mm -hmm. So it's actually having like damage to our nerves long term as well. So that's really concerning. Right. And then I start to wonder where else is it damaging? Where else is it? Yeah, no, it's, it, you know, I think we're, you know, finding out more and more as, as we go. Uh, the other thing is, is organizing pneumonia. You know, I, I wanted to mention that we don't really discuss it in this, uh, in this talk, but organizing pneumonia, the pulmonologists are giving high dose steroids for sometimes I think up to six months, they're giving it kind of long duration of steroids and want to just make sure that we mention that as well. And and people that are requiring a tracheostomy, uh, you know, long-term weaning of uh, ventilator dependence is, is not often successful. And, you know, it seems like I've seen this kind of a lot where they get a, a trach, they never get off the vent and they get sent to a facility to be on, a, you know, a ventilator forever. And those patients, when you see the morbidity that's caused by COVID, uh, that's not included in, you know, the mortality rates. and when people just focus on mortality rates of COVID, it, it's kind of, uh, you're missing a lot of the mortality, morbidity, uh, like people that are uh, trached and ventilator dependent for the rest of their lives. So uh, it, it's a, a something that, you know, if you're not also discussing all of this morbidity and, and the uh, complications, it's hard to get a full grasp of just how devastating COVID is. And the most common pulmonary symptom reported from uh, COVID is dyspnea, and it can persist in 22 to 53% of patients for two months after symptom onset. So it can last quite a long time. Uh, as far as subjective symptoms, you know, uh, 
they're kind of the subject to feeling of dyspnea, but then there's also uh, the need for oxygen. And dependence on oxygen has reported in up to 6.6% of survivors. So even though the patient left the hospital and went home, they may still require oxygen. And, you know, some people have described kind of the early stage with edema and inflammation, zero to one, then that exudative diffuse alveolar damage, one to seven, organizing pneumonia stage, one week to several weeks, and then the fibrotic stage, weeks to months. They can continue with fibrosis and it can actually be quite bad. We've had people, you know, go home after essentially recovering from COVID, but then they bounce back to the hospital with a lot of fibrosis, um, high need for oxygen. And then there's this question of, you know, do they have a new bacterial infection on top of it? Some people have RSV or they'll have a, a, another viral component afterwards that, that is really quite hard to deal with when they have all this fibrosis and all this underlying uh, now chronic fibrotic lung, lung damage. So yeah. it's really something that we do not much difference in yeah. young people. Okay? Yeah. Young people can also um, otherwise they have any disease. Like I just can't emphasize how important it is to get vaccinated. Um, because in vaccinated patients with well, COVID-19, I haven't seen this severe um, issues. Yeah. So you know. The other thing it can do besides fibrosis is cause cavitary lesions. And we'll look at that in, in one of the slides. But, uh, you know, with all the, you know, killing of the lung cells and then all the inflammation that's created with COVID, sometimes it can, can essentially create some necrosis there and uh, create a hole in the lung, which we will see. And I wanted to include this. This seems like it's obvious, but kind of early in, in COVID, there was a study through cardiology that was looking at patients who underwent surgeries, whether it's elective or emergent, with a COVID positive test. And uh, you can imagine that's not, not great, but they had increased mortality and pulmonary complications. So if they just had a positive test and they weren't so much looking at their symptoms, they were just looking at a positive test before a procedure, uh, you know, I would imagine the surgeons wanted to, you know, they always like, like to operate, not have anything folded up, but, you know, this was showing evidence that patients with positive tests have worse outcomes. And I think that's important to under, understand. So, can you guys hear me okay now? It might be my mask. Is this loud enough or no? Jackie, can you tell me if this is loud enough or no? Yep, you sound good. Okay, thank you. So um, here I wanted to kind of highlight um, our thoracic society guidelines on empyema. Because we have seen a lot of patients with COVID-19 lung infection have empyema, which is basically, you know, between your lungs and your pleural space having fluid and that fluid getting really infected with bacterial organisms or other organisms. So what they categorize empyema as a presence of pleural effusion should be investigated in all patients, signs and symptoms of pneumonia or unexplained sepsis. So we should be thinking about this in COVID-19 patients. Failure of community or healthcare associated pneumonia despite you're treating them and they're decompensating, there also you should be thinking about do they have an empyema. Recently, I've seen a lot of patients. I've had patients with Pseudomonas empyema, Staph aureus empyema, um, and um, it, uh, you know, chest X-ray wasn't as clear, but when we got the CT scan, it was definitely clear to see that empyema developing in our patients. What are your thoughts, Dr. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is something. Um, yeah, I totally agree. We'll see empyemas in these patients, and then, uh, you know. When they have fluid there, the question is, um, you know, uh, do they need a, a tube? Do they need a drain in, or can they just get it aspirated and treated? And, and I think, yeah. I want to kind of show you guys this case. 31 year old male admitted with COVID 19, and then he develops pneumonia. And then, as you guys see here, let me point that to the 
the blue arrow where you all are seeing, that's fluid collection. And that ends up growing bacteria. So he had empyema because of after COVID-19. And he's a very young individual. So I think that's why if you look at the chest X-ray, you could see it, but sometimes it's not as obvious. So it's really important if you're suspecting, get a good image, ultrasound at the bedside or CT scan is going to be really important. Anything? Yeah. So, yeah, so right here, the arrow's pointing at it, but here you have an uh, air fluid level and you can see exactly that, you know, you lose the heart border and, and it's uh, all full here. So, you know, what imaging space should you be all using? Um, consider uh, ultrasound at bedside, x-ray, of course. Um, but, and of course, the third option would be CT scan of the chest to make sure you're able to see if there's fluid collection. And the reason we need to know this is it's because it's going to determine, do we need to drain or is the patient going to need surgery? So when you do drainage of this fluid, it's really important in the ID world, send it for culture. Yeah, that, that would be one of the important things to send so we know which antibiotic we have. And also gram stain is really helpful. So uh, for us, it's really important. Sometimes we struggle because a lot of people forget this culture and culture is so important. And then pH is really important because if the pH is really low, less than 7.2, that tells you if you give antibiotic, it's not going to get into that state, right? It's like loculated pick. So if you have that acidic pH, you're going to need to do intervention like put in a test tube, you know, ask the CT surgeon to clean that out. So pH is going to be really important. LDH and glucose, yes, you can get it, but I'm not, I don't use it as much. And then, of course, um, a culture, making sure we send culture, aerobic, anaerobic, fungal culture, if you want. But making sure we send cultures is very important. Yeah, and if you're having low uh, pH like this, you would put in a drain. You wouldn't yes. just aspirate. Sometimes people just aspirate and take the fluid out. But, you know, putting in a drain uh, would really be, you know, the best course of action for those patients. Uh, because if you just give antibiotic and that loculated fluid is so acidic, it's not going to yeah, work. It kind of turns off the antibiotics. Yeah. That's the way I think about it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. So you need a drain. Plus so what is the antibiotic of choice, right? So let's say you have a patient, for example, they had community acquired pneumonia, you know, they were had COVID-19. They had community acquired pneumonia, which you're worried about. And they have fluid collection, so you get a like community acquired infection. So you can use ceftriaxone. But the important point when it comes to empyema is that we have to cover for anaerobic organisms. So if you see point number three, if you have loculated fluid collection that is like, like that and it's you know in the lungs, even though you might you are treating for like strep pneumo, high degree of concern is you might still have anaerobes. So that's why we do cefriaxone and flagell or unison, which has anaerobic coverage as well. Yeah, so even if the anaerobic cultures are negative, we would still cover for anaerobes. Uh, and you know, that's something that's recommended. So essentially, if you're giving uh, like cefriaxone, you would add metronidazole, and, and then you would treat for, it says two to four weeks. You know, if they have a chest tube or something, I usually go four weeks. Um, and then kind of depending on the organisms, you know, if you can give something that uh, a PO that's bio, very bioavailable, uh, that might be an option, but still probably a better idea to give at least two weeks of IV and then switch to PO after that uh, for, for some patients that are really pretty bad. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. And this two to four week is really important because you shouldn't stop antibiotic until you re image, right? You gotta see is it better? Is it, you know, so making sure that follow the patient and re image and making sure everything is resolved. Yeah, and, and we're gonna talk about lung abscesses as well, but that's what I do with lung abscesses for sure is, you know, people will call and they'll say, How long do you treat a lung abscess? And it's kind of variable, right? So you might have a lung abscess that's really tiny, or sometimes they have one that's huge. And uh, really, the most important thing is to re-image and uh, kind of uh, re-image to ensure resolution. 
is what I would say. So you want to treat it until it's gone. And if it's larger, it may take a longer time to treat. Okay, another one, because I get a lot of questions about empyema. Like pneumonia treatment is only seven days, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you do longer? And the longer is because it's fluid collection, drainage. So um, I, you know, our learners, I'll be trying to teach them all the time, but it's really important two to four weeks, re-image, making sure the drain is in the right place, it's draining properly. So you need to do drain checks. All of those will be really important. Yeah, and I kind of think about it as like, you know, when you see the amount of fluid and pus in there and infection in there, you know, how to get the antibiotics into that, you know, sufficiently saturated with antibiotics and into the middle of that just bucket, uh, bucket of pus is, you know, you need to really treat it for a long duration until the body can kind of um, begin to heal with all that, you know, it's, but it's, it's such a bad infection that you want to make sure you have it under control. Otherwise, it can, it can kind of linger on, especially if you don't have further imaging to make sure it's all going away. Uh, and it, it's, and really make sure it's all drained out is one of the yeah. top things. So the and here we have uh, lung cavitation from COVID-19 pneumonia. This, uh, this image actually came from this study that uh, it was essentially describing it. And, you know, I've seen this a few times where they'll have, uh, COVID-19, and then they'll come in to the hospital several weeks or months later with a cavitary lesion there. And I kind of think about it as, you know, COVID-19 was causing so much inflammation and killing, uh, especially the type two alveolar cells. And it just caused so much inflammation that uh, it caused necrosis of the lung right there. And they essentially have a hole in their lung. And that's not great. I think we're gonna continue to see this for months or years in the future where patients are gonna come in and have a cavitary lesion and uh, you know, a, as a result from COVID-19 infection. And sometimes when people have cavitary lungs, uh, a, cav a cavity in their lungs, they'll get fungal infections like an uh, aspergilloma, they'll get a fungal ball in there or they'll get um, <laughs> fluid in there or uh, anaerobes or, or something like that. It can cause issues, but yeah, I've seen this kind of a number of times and it's, uh, it's really concerning for people that, uh, like we're talking about, they'll go home with dyspnea or they'll go home with kind of long symptoms and they don't know that they have a hole in their lung as well that yeah. will cause problems sometime in the future. You know, another thing is whenever you see now the cavitary lung lesion, you immediately get scared is this TB. Is this TB, right? Yeah. yeah. So there are a lot of patients are getting a lot of uh, workup unnecessary too, but you have to, because sometimes you don't yep. know they're doing AFPs and you know, putting them in airborne precaution. So something that we have to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is good to know that. So in the future, if you see someone with a cavitary lesion, um, you know, COVID-19 is going to be in your differential as something that caused that. Diagram of like um, figuring out stages of empyema and requiring surgical intervention. So, um, can the patient tolerate single lung ventilation versus no? So, if they cannot, then you have to do go to thoracotomy and clean it out, actual surgery in the lung. But if they could do single lung ventilation, meaning they'll tolerate surgery. Then you do a VETS, video assisted approach, where the CT surgeon goes in a video with a scope and then cleans out the area and then puts in a chest tube. So, um, and then making sure the lungs are able to expand appropriately. So, this is kind of the guidance the CT surgeons use. You know, I'm not an expert, but I thought it was a really nice way to quickly look at when they do what. And the other complications, like Dr has been saying is that we've been seeing a lot of lung abscesses from COVID-19. So how do you get lung abscess? Um, um, you could have acute and chronic lung abscess. Acute is less than six weeks. Chronic is more than six weeks. Primary lung abscess, so aspiration, necrotizing pneumonia. Uh, secondary is you know, hematologically disseminated, let's say of MSSA say bacteremia, now it landed in the lung, now you have lung abscess. A way of spreading, either by mouth um, hemato or hematologically through the blood. 
So that's important. And we are seeing more and more lung atrophies. Anything you would add? I know I, you know, when people get infections, they oftentimes get infections in areas that already are damaged. And with COVID damaging the lungs, it, it you know, is a nice atmosphere for abscesses to get set up. Especially those cavities that we just showed. Yeah. yeah. So we actually did a study um, in France in one center. They looked at um, 161 patients who were required ventilation um, who had COVID-19. And out of the 100, 161, 119 had ventilator-associated pneumonia. Out of the 119, 68 had a CT scan. And out of that, they found out 17 patients had lung abscesses. So that's pretty significant, right? And out of 119 patients who had ventilator-associated pneumonia, 14% overall had lung abscess in this one single center study. So I think it's really important to keep this in back of your mind. If your patient is not getting better, you're treating them for pneumonia. If you have not imaged them recently, it's really important to think about, should I get a CT scan to look at for empyema and lung abscess? And here's pictures uh, from this study where they looked at different patients and having lung abscesses. Yeah, and you can see the air fluid levels here with, with uh, you know, these lung abscesses. And the mean time for developing lung abscesses was about 16 days um, being in the hospital intubated. So it happens around two weeks after mean um, time of, if you have a patient in the hospital after two weeks, they're decompensating. We have to start thinking lung abscesses or empyema. And generally with lung abscesses, you know, if you're trying to get an organism, you know, it, it depends how sick they are. I, I usually try to get sputum first if they're if they're pretty sick. I try to get sputum first. If you don't get any sputum or you don't have an organism uh, growing in the blood, uh, bronchoscopy may be another option where they can go in and and get uh, a sample that that may grow something. Uh, but otherwise, you're going to be treating with antibiotics um, to cover very broadly until you know essentially until you know what it is. Uh, is that your approach too, yes. or do you do it differently? Yeah. Yeah. So sputum, when, and when people have pneumonias, sputum culture um, often isn't very helpful, but when it is helpful, it's very helpful. So here from this study, they looked at microbiologically, what are the most common pathogens? So a lot of them have some had monobacterial, just one organism. A lot of them had multiple different bacteria. And the most common bacteria was Pseudomonas. And we all know that's what we've been seeing a lot, Pseudomonas, and also Staph aureus. It could be MSSA or MRSA. In this study, it was majority MSSA. So Staph and Pseudomonas were really on the top of the list when it came to lung abscesses. So it Again, if you have ventilator-associated pneumonia, patient has been here for more than two weeks, we should broaden the therapy, vancozosin, right, or vancocephalpine flagell, and then imaging the cultures. But these are the really two most common bacteria. And then, of course, you had Klebsiella, E. coli, other gram negatives as well. But Pseudomonas and Staph aureus were top two. So, um, here is um, the chest um, guidelines. They recently they had a study that they did where they looked at lung abscesses and could you get X-rays or CT. So this study they looked at CT scan on 56 people who had lung abscesses and looked at how long did it take for the lung abscess to get better. Next slide. So um, what they found in this study was uh, MSSA. Strep CC, Pseudomonas, most common bacteria again. Medium time for the lung abscess to get better was 16 weeks, about four months. So that's why it's really important to treat the patients properly and also have follow up imaging, like you were saying. And they also said if the lung abscess is more than six centimeters, and if you're elderly, um, it took even longer and you had more complications. So again, so, sometimes size of the abscess will influence recovery too. 
but it's really important to keep a really, really close eye on empyemas and lung abscesses, like Dr. Horn was saying. Even if the patients get discharged, re-imaging them and making sure you might have to continue antibiotics for lung abscess for a couple of months, right? Oral might be okay, but it might be longer duration of treatment. And then this is defining and managing COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis. This is, is Kappa, COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis. And we're actually seeing this quite a bit recently. Um, you know, we've been seeing it kind of all along with COVID, but um, I don't know, I, recently I feel like I've been seeing this kind of a lot. And again, these patients may be hospitalized, may be on a ventilator for a prolonged period of time, or you know, we've had some patients that have COVID, seem like they're improving a bit, go home and then come back with it. And so I think this is a really good topic. And one of the main things with Kappa, with this aspergillosis, is, is, is thinking about it, is uh, identifying patients and saying, you know, that could be a possibility. And sometimes it's hard to definitively say a person has uh, aspergillosis. And in those patients, especially when they're very sick, I would start Coriconazole and then kind of do a further workup and kind of go from there. But it, you know, that's kind of a common question we've been getting is this patient could have it. I'm not sure. Should we start Waricanazole now or should we wait? I think starting is earlier yes. is better in those patients. Yeah. And again, um, what we're seeing in our hospitals when they get uh, aspergillosis is about like 10 to 14 days after being in the ICU, ventilated, or on the and, two week mark. And on steroids too, is yes. a big part of it too, is yeah. they get kind of prolonged steroids and sometimes they'll keep the steroids going for a long time, whether it's concerned for the organizing pneumonia or the patient's just so sick that uh, they'll, they'll keep the high dose steroids on, which is also increases the risk for aspergillosis. Yeah. And all the tosi and baricinidib we're giving too. So uh, just keep that, you know, even in, um, in, I'm sure in rehab in our critical access hospitals, so you guys are probably getting patients coming back from acute care facilities. So it's kind of important to kind of keep this in the back of your mind. Could they be developing this? Yeah, and, and the patients that are, uh, especially patients if they have an uh, underlying immunodeficiency and then they get COVID, um, you know, I think we have a, a bit about risk factors in here, but here are some COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis. Yeah. And, and you can see that, you know, the lungs are so bad, it, it's hard to, um, say much more than they look terrible. Um, and these are from three different patients who all had aspergillosis and the infiltrates you get from aspergillosis. So it's pretty significant. Yeah, and, and when you have ground glass, uh, sometimes all over with from COVID, it's hard to kind of look and, and see, you know, is there a halo sign or is there, you know, is there a little bit of a consolidation here or there? When just the lungs overall just look so bad, it can be tough. We did look at um, there's another study where they looked at 30 day mortality for patients who got aspergillosis and they were in the ICU. So if they didn't have aspergillosis, their mortality was they were much better. But if you have aspergillosis with COVID, you had higher rate of increased rate of death. So it's really important, especially for your high risk and um, sick patients to think about this and treat them as soon as you can. I also wanted to touch on the halo sign. So with aspergillosis, uh, there's something called a halo sign that can be seen on CT scan. And this is the halo sign here. So you can see this kind of, um, well, halo, I guess. <laughs> you can kind of see this, this area here surrounding um, the uh, the ball here, and uh, this is thought to be from you know aspergillus can uh, infiltrate the vasculature, and it kind of uh, goes out into the lung. And when it does, this is thought to be fluid and blood from going into the vasculature surrounding it. So uh, as it expands and it grows out, it, it goes into the tissue here and causes causes the uh, kind of to be leaky, I guess you could say, and causes a halo. Now. This is a very obvious one. You can see that you know there's um, uh, this white area and then this gray area around it. But in patients with uh, ground glass kind of all over the place, it's hard to kind of look and say, is that you know 
some of the ground glass area, or is this uh, does this look like a halo sign? And so, um, yeah, and this this says angioinvasive aspergillosis, and this this is a halo sign. There's also a reverse halo yeah. sign from Mucor, and these were really uh, described in, in patients that um, are really immunosuppressed. But now with COVID, we're seeing aspergillosis in, in, in COVID patients, whether they're immunosuppressed or not. Um, you know, and so here is another one. I wanted to show some uh, very characteristic, typical halo signs before. Um, you know, so, so you can kind of get the idea of there's this halo around it. It and was so easier, right? Before um, you didn't have COVID and when you got aspergillosis, at least we have got this clue. Yeah. Now um, COVID destroying the lungs, plus it's so hard to differentiate, but if you see it, it's great. Yeah, yeah, if you see it, you can say, you know, this patient has COVID and they may be declining, they may be getting worse and worse and worse. And you're looking at it saying, what else should I be thinking about? And if you can see a halo sign, it can be helpful. Diagnostically, if you're thinking this is getting worse, if you're thinking they need fungal coverage, you should get a fungal sputum, a serum fungital, and serum gelatinamin. So fungital is a marker that is found in cell wall of fungus. Serum gelatinamin is a marker that's found on aspergillosis cell wall. If they're elevated, it can give you a clue, okay, they might have cold um, gelosis, we need to treat it. But if they're not elevated, you could still have the infection. So it, if it's there, it's helpful, but if it's not there, if you're still suspecting, you treat. And then, of course, if you can do a bronchoscopy, then you should get a bronchoscopy galactomanum, which is more sensitive than the serum galactomanum. So these are some diagnostic things that you guys could think about when you're worried about aspergillosis in your COVID-19 patients. Right, and with the bronchoscopy, if they're able to get a piece of tissue and you can see the aspergillus invasion into the tissue, uh, that would be really the best, but that's, yes. that's hard. Yes. Uh, I, you, I, you almost never see yeah. uh, something like that where it's... Um, so now um, treatment-wise, for the most part, we have... Aspergillosis are pretty susceptible to voriconazole. So voriconazole should be a go-to drug. But if a patient is having kidney failure, right? Um, and so it's hard to sometimes give IV vori, but if they could take oral voriconazole, that's fine. Your other option is isovuconazole. It's a new antifungal. It's kind of expensive, but that is also really good for aspergillosis. And your third option is amphotericin B. So go to always should be a voriconazole as your drug of choice. Yes, voriconazole. I, you know, I think the studies show that voriconazole is superior to amphotericin. Yes. You know, if a patient comes in and you're not sure if they have mucor or aspergillus, uh, if they're on voriconazole, they actually have do better and mortality is improved. Or if they're on voriconazole earlier in the course before you're sure, um, then. But you know, if they have mucor. It's, it's better to be on amphotericin, but if it's early, you're not sure, um, you know, it, it can be tough. You kind of just have to take a guess. But with aspergillus, really voriconazole drug yeah. of choice. And isovuconazole is pretty cool antifungal drug because it covers both aspergillosis yeah. and mucor. Cost, of course, is high, but if you really need something to cover both, you could do that. Right, and especially if their kidneys are really poor, yes. isovuconazole would be a good Exactly. So aspergillosis in your lung, optimal duration, kind of not known, but ideally six to 12 weeks of antifungal treatment. Reasonable to do a follow-up CT to make sure everything has gotten better. Um, immunocompromised patient like your bone marrow transplant, um, um, you know, solid organ transplant, you might need longer a duration of treatment, it depends. But, and also having these markers can sometimes help you. Usually what I have been doing is treating our patients for about 12 weeks or so for majority of the aspergillosis diagnosis with COVID-19. So I think that's all we have today to cover. So we kind of went over long COVID with lung issues, empyema with COVID-19, lung abscesses with COVID-19, and also aspergillosis complication, fungal infection with COVID-19. 
um, and the importance of like the right treatment and the right diagnosis. Do you guys have any questions for us? You could put it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask us. Happy to answer. Well, thank you. All right, thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions about this, please contact us. We're happy to help with any questions that you have. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.